Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Great stuff. Um, so if you're not on mute already as a panelist, if you can pop onto mute for me, that would be fantastic. So good morning, everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to the second in our webinar series on delivering impactful nature-based solutions under a new environmental land management scheme. I'm Nikki Roach. I'm the president-elect at SIWEM, which is the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management. For those of you who might not be familiar with SIWEM, a very warm welcome. We are a royal chartered professional institution representing a community of thousands of water and environment management professionals and organisations across the world. And when we say water and environment, we mean just that. We're all about working in a really integrated way, bringing multidisciplinary skill sets to bear on the really knotty multidimensional challenges that exist in the midst of climate and nature and sustainability emergencies that we find ourselves in. So if we are new to you and you to us and you like today's events, do get in touch. We'd be delighted to hear from you and we'll share details about how you can do that later on. Our vision is a safer, sustainable world. And right now that seems like an incredible challenge, doesn't it? But one thing that's been thrust to the front of many people's consciousnesses in recent weeks of lockdown is how important nature and our ability to interact with it is to us. Nature provides us with all kinds of services and the way we manage our land has a massive bearing on how extensive and effective those services are. As we move away from the common agricultural policy following Brexit, the Agriculture Bill establishes the legal basis for a fundamental shift in the principles under which farmers and land managers such as foresters will be financially supported outside of the European Union. We move towards the concept of public money for public goods, which was originally established in the 25-year environment plan, which DEFRA is shaping into its thinking for the new environmental subsidy regime, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, or ELMS, as I've come to know of it. What this means is that payment, payments under ELMS are proposed to move away from the old area-based basic payment system towards an outcomes-based system, which supports the delivery of a range of public goods, with three tiers proposed for how extensive and coordinated delivery of these goods will be. These nature-based solutions need land to grow and develop. And most of the land in this country is used for the likes of agriculture and forestry. So it completely stands to reason that an agricultural support scheme should be central to a concerted drive to enhance and replenish the services that nature can provide us with. DEFRA has been developing its thinking about the form and function of the new scheme over the past couple of years through its health and harmony consultation in 2018, and more recently, through its Farming for the Future and ELM policy discussion documents and associated consultation. Because of the disruption caused by the coronavirus crisis, this consultation has been paused, but that gives us the ideal opportunity to compare notes, share ideas and test our thinking before it resumes and we make final responses to DEFRA once it does. This week, we're looking specifically at natural flood management, or NFM. It's going to be acronym-tastic today. After this winter's flooding, the ability to better manage land upstream of at-risk communities was brought into focus as record-breaking flows hit many rivers. Hard-engineered defences can only do so much and may have downsides, particularly for communities downstream of them. And there's concern that land management practices in recent decades have contributed to the rate at which water flows off land in our upper catchments and in our towns and cities into our rivers, increasing flood risk to communities downstream. Slowing the flow has become an increasingly familiar concept, restoring more natural functionality back into our landscape as a means to hold water back and reduce the peak level of a flood. NFM is a concept that's increasingly being understood and applied with great success. And the natural and landscape components of the approach is something which potentially fits well into the concept of a public good that can be paid for by public money and delivered by farmers and land managers. So how could ELM encourage and enable wider use of natural flood management? What are the enablers and potential barriers to its delivery? How is woodland delivery being encouraged and delivered in upland areas where this approach could deliver benefits? And how, finally, how can we get nature and specifically animals to help deliver some of the benefits of NFM? So we are delighted to welcome four fantastic speakers to talk about exactly these questions for you. We have Chris Utley from the Environment Agency to talk about how ELMS might help to drive flood risk management in England from the EA's perspective. Then we've got Steve Maslin and Rachel Nye from Jeremy Benn Associates, who undertook research work for DEFRA, looking at what the particular enablers and barriers are to delivering NFM schemes. 
hopefully there'll be some interesting lessons there that can be worked into the thinking about how elms can be shaped to deliver natural flood management effectively. Following Rachel and Steve, we'll hear from Tristan Gatley from the Forestry Commission about how woodland creation has been evolving effectively in the Peak District, with a little bit about the Moors for the Future project, one of the focuses of which has been improving the water retaining abilities of the moors and the steep sided gullies that drain off them. And finally, beavers, nature's own river engineers, are slowly being reintroduced back to the UK. Their ability to dam streams and rivers and hold back water could save us doing that ourselves. But what might be the impacts for landowners and managers? How could beaver managed riparian woodlands work effectively in this country and how could they be facilitated through arms? Chris Jones from the Beaver Trust um, is going to give us some of his thoughts. So before we launch into our talks this morning and I get off your screens, a quick bit of housekeeping. So Jane's going to share with you from Siwen the Slido uh, in a second. We'll be splitting this two hour session into two halves and we're going to hear first from our first two speakers and after which I'll ask them a couple of questions to spur some discussion. If you were on our webinar last week, thank you so much for giving us feedback. We really heard that and we want to make sure that you, the audience, can pose plenty of questions as well as crucially seeing what everybody else is asking and commenting on. So this time we're going to test Slido rather than Zoom Q&A to let you ask questions or vote on those that others have posed. So if you really like them, you can put those forward to our speakers. So if you've got a second device, please head to slido.com, that's S-L-I-D-O.com, thanks Jane, and enter the code N-B-S-2, N-B-S-2. You can submit your questions within the Q&A section on Slido at any time during all of our presentations. And if you read a question that you like and you want to ask that somebody else has posed, just hit the thumbs up and that will promote that question submitted by others. You can also interact with each other and comment on any active questions in Slido by hitting reply underneath the question. If you can't use Slido right now, and we know some devices don't support it, don't worry, we'll display the most voted for questions on the screen. We're going to use Slido to ask your views as well on three questions which have been put forward by DEFRA to help inform their consultation process, and one to help us here at Siren. You can answer those at any time, including after today's session, and we're going to leave the poll open for the rest of today. So at any point, head to slido.com and hit NBS2. There was really good engagement with our poll last week. We'll be feeding those responses back to DEFRA at the end of these series. And uh, Jane just popped on the screen there some of the highlights from last week's poll. Some of your responses were really long and comprehensive, others short and punchy. Whatever works for you. Obviously, we can't show you the long ones here, but your feedback is really important to DEFRA and it will help inform the scheme. So if you can and you have some thoughts, do take a few minutes to respond. So without further ado, it's time to introduce you to our first speaker. Chris Utley has worked in countryside and conservation management for most of his career, but he recently spent four years with Stroud District Council working with farmers, landowners and communities to implement natural flood management in the catchment of the Stroud frame. He now works as a senior flood and coastal advisor with the Environment Agency in a team specialising in nature-based solutions and integrating management of the environment into flood and coastal risk management. He's leading the flood and coastal risk management input into the wider EA work and advice on Elm, and I'm delighted to welcome you. So, over to you, Chris. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, well, as Nikki said, yeah, I spent four years um, before joining the EA, working on the practical end of natural flood management, talking to large numbers of farmers and woodland owners, smallholders, uh, and recreational landowners. And um, it's fair to say that I found existing agri-environment schemes uh, were not the most useful tool for natural flood management um, during my time uh, working with them. So, so this uh, current role I have and the, the opportunity to, during lockdown, to do quite a lot of thinking about how elms in particular uh, could unlock the potential there is or for reducing flood risk. Um, and I want to share some of that thinking with you. So as I say on the front here, uh, these are not existing policy. These are just some thoughts and ideas that um, uh, we're, we're kind of um, developing and uh, feeding into the development process through our Elms Leads uh, and into DEFRA. So this is a, a quick introduction really to some of the practicalities for how Elm 
might be able to contribute to reducing flood risk. It's often cited as one of those major public goods, and, and in fact, I see it cited frequently as one of the most important public goods that Elm will deliver, but it won't happen on its own. And we need to work hard to develop a sophisticated understanding of how land management and land use interacts with flood risk, uh, and a sophisticated understanding of, of what we call natural flood management, looking at different types of risk and the different types of activities, who is at risk and where they are at risk uh, to inform our, our development of the scheme. Uh, let's not forget that many farms are at risk themselves and Elm could be a vehicle to help those farms adapt, and change their business models for future climate change, whilst at the same time helping to reduce risk to our villages and towns and infrastructure. So next slide, please. So some of the topics I want to cover very quickly, links to existing policy, uh, which we won't dwell on for too long, and the evidence base for effective nature-based solutions, um, the types of actions that um, we want to see implemented in ELM based upon the evidence. How do we determine spatial priorities? How can we target our activity most effectively? Um, how do we measure effectiveness and link that effectiveness to payments? Um, is it possible to link um, payments for flood risk uh, outcomes uh, to individual landowners? What advice and guidance might be needed to make this work? And importantly, how will we blend funding? So how will Elm work alongside existing flood grant and aid or local levy funding? Next slide, please. Okay, very quickly, we've had a fantastic introduction to the changes from Nikki, so I won't dwell here. Suffice to say, um, uh, the penultimate bullet point there, potentially three billion pounds per annum available. Um, if we compare that with our existing new settlement for flood grant and aid of just over five billion over six years, that puts into perspective some of the uh, finance opportunity available uh, to us uh, for achieving all of these public goods. The next slide, please. Okay, the Environment Agency published uh, its draft <coughs> uh, national flood and coastal erosion risk management strategy um, last year, about a year ago today, actually. Um, and uh, that contained uh, lots of exciting innovations from my perspective. So lots of um, uh, attention paid to how we're going to mainstream nature-based solutions, how we're going to increase working with landowners and farmers. Uh, and and drive more working together and partnership working between those landowners and farmers and other risk management authorities. Future adaptation of low-lying farmlands, um, how we can uh, work with uh, farmers to see what's going to happen in the future to those low-lying farmlands. Uh, importantly, development and implementation of ELMS or um, uh, other agro-environment incentives and regulation to reduce flood risk. And also the links between flood risk and, and net gain uh, and nature recovery too. So next slide, please. So a quick review of the evidence available um, before we get into some of the detail. There's a number of meta studies that have brought together existing evidence. Uh, and what they show effectively is that slow the flow techniques, and you will see me trying to divide and natural flood management up in this presentation because I think we need to have a more sophisticated language to discuss this. They show that what we call slow the flow techniques can be effective uh, for the type of lower magnitude, higher frequency events um, which occur in smaller catchments. So properties in smaller operational catchments at higher moderate risk of fluvial and surface flooding. They can be very effective for what we call surface or so-called muddy floods, i.e. the sort of runoff events uh, that can occur from land that affect uh, individual or small numbers of properties. And the word operational catchment is important here. Um, in my view, I think um, we've uh, allowed some confusion between geographical catchment size 
the seven, for instance, and the operational catchment size. Uh, so natural flood management, so the flow uh, could still be effective in large areas of the seven catchment. But what we're talking about, of course, are the tributaries and places within the seven with smaller operational catchments upstream of those properties. It does not mean that slow the flow uh, should be excluded from large catchments because of course those are just made up of smaller catchments. Um, the evidence shows that what we're really concerned with here is where to take forward this work and the scale of activity. So how much do we need to do and where do we need to do it? We know that these techniques impact on the hydrology. Um, so what we need to understand is how much of this we need to put in place and where it's going to be most effective. Importantly, what these studies show is that the co-benefits from these techniques are extremely good. And there is great evidence to show that slow the flow um, techniques tend to provide co-benefits such as nature recovery, better water quality, they can increase groundwater recharge and infiltration, and importantly, carbon sequestration. The evidence for flood storage uh, and techniques such as coastal realignment and coastal habitat creation is extremely good. We know that storing floodwaters uh, um, is an, a very effective method for reducing flood risk. And we also know that beaches, sand dunes and salt marsh are fully already recognized as part of our coastal defense asset um, system. Um, and increasing use of salt marsh and sand dunes could do a great deal towards reducing erosion and wave energy um, on our coasts. The next slide, please. <clears throat> so what type of actions are we looking at for elms? Just a few moments putting that evidence into perspective um, and land management or hydrology speak. Um, we know that we can reduce flooding by increasing roughness. So creating rougher vegetation in flows is our first technique. Increasing losses through infiltration or evapotranspiration. So that's uh, infiltration into the soils or evapotranspiration into the air through vegetation. Attenuating or storing water is extremely effective. And we know that uh, attenuating water temporarily for release later in the flood cycle is a very effective way of reducing flood risk. How do we translate that into actions and activities that farmers and landowners can put into place? We've started to think of um, our natural flood management compendium or um, kind of encyclopedia of, of actions um, as kind of four discrete types of activity which are gonna be effective in different situations uh, in different parts of the, um, the country, but also uh, from a financial perspective, are gonna be attracting different funding streams. So next slide, please. I'll just go quickly through these. Um, the first type of activity that or package of works that we, that we uh, have grouped together are these kind of so-called large scale land use natural flood management techniques that require some significant engineering input. So big capital projects, but as part of nature-based working. So managed realignments, floodplain restoration or reconnection. So creating these larger scale storage uh, areas or big habitat creation techniques, moving existing coastal defenses to reduce erosion. So that's the first kind of package of works that we think are significant for ELM. Next slide, please. <clears throat> The second package is what I think most people think of when we're talking about natural flood management. And we might call this the kind of archetypal slow the flow type works. So minor uh, capital uh, works that produce small changes in topography or landscape. Um, we've started to call these, I've started to call these lumps and bumps. Uh, so minor changes to topography that change the hydrology, change the water flow over the land and can be acro applied across large areas of land, very cheap, uh, very simple and effective to construct. So there's some examples here. Uh, that's the second package of work that we think is quite effective uh, or to consider for ELMS. Third um, package, next slide please, is what we might simply call changes 
to farming, farming practice and land management. So this is soil, crop, livestock, husbandry techniques, uh, basic uh, small scale changes to land management and farming uh, that increase infiltration, reduce runoff or reduce erosion. And there's a whole plethora of uh, techniques and small changes that work within a farming system that will produce these sorts of benefits. Uh, importantly, and I'm gonna come onto this later, uh, very difficult to fund these types of works through existing flood risk and coastal erosion management uh, funding streams, because quite simply the linkage uh, between effective flood management and these techniques is, is, um, is not poor, but it's difficult to demonstrate unless these techniques are put in place over large areas of land. So the fourth type of package that we want to consider, next slide please, is what most people think of when they're thinking of nature-based solutions. So these are landscape scale land use changes to restore habitats or increase the increased roughness, increase infiltration and evapotranspiration, but do not require significant re-engineering or engineering of the landscape. So things like woodland creation, tree planting, rewilding, peatland restoration projects. And these can be extremely effective as part of our slow to flow package upstream in our headwaters. Um, <coughs> again, sometimes difficult to fund using existing flood risk finance. Next slide, please. Mary Barnes last week um, uh, went through some of this. So I won't go through some of this in, in more detail, but suffice to say, with the three tier system, um, it doesn't take a great deal of imagination to, to, to think about which types of the activities will fit into our three tiers. Some of the basic land management, basic public goods within tier one, um, our slow the flow techniques, our topographical changes, our landscape changes, leaky woody dams, etc. Uh, within tier two and then some of the major habitat restoration schemes landscape scale uh, land use change within tier three and a combination of all those will help farmers adapt their agricultural practices um, so that we can reduce the impacts of flooding on farmers themselves but also make that contribution to reducing flooding across the whole catchment next slide please So an important aspect of how ELM will drive better uh, flood risk management is in spatial prioritization. How can we make sure our activity and energy are focused in the right places? Where are the people and properties who can benefit most from actions? Simply focusing on opportunity will not be good enough to ensure public good. So we need to prioritize places where we can maximize the public good. So we don't know at the moment if spatial prioritization will be driven by national priorities or local choices or a combination of both. But in either scenario, we need to equip operational colleagues in the Environment Agency and in other risk management authorities with the information and data to go into those local discussions um, to, to secure activity within priority places. So in the EA, we're envisaging a, a requirement for a number of different spatial products or mapping systems for flood risk reduction. So what most people think of as NFM, this slow in the flow, um, we know from evidence that these types of measures work best in smaller catchments, higher magnitude, uh, lower, mag lower magnitude floods. Um, so we want a simple system for identifying uh, those places. And you can see a map here uh, where we've created a simple algorithm to do that. We also need to prioritize these larger floodplain storage areas. Uh, we need to prioritize on the basis of coastal realignment and water level management. Next slide, please. Can we link payments to deliver of those public goods? Um, is it possible to link the payments to a reduction in flood risk? I think in simple terms, my view is no. I don't think we should waste time trying to calculate the exact contribution an individual farmer makes to reducing risk. It would be too complex. We don't expect individual farmers to solve water quality or restore biodiversity, but we can develop systems that link to proxy payments like attenuation or evapotranspiration. Um, 
all public goods are the cumulative benefit of lots of different individual actions. So trying to uh, ascribe an individual uh, farmer's contribution to reducing risk will be extremely difficult. We can't do it uh, over a large scale for lots of natural food management already, so we shouldn't really try to do that uh, within ELMS. But there are other factors to consider too. So how many other public goods have been produced? How long will the measures take to put in place? Next slide, please. One important output will be the creation of, uh, hopefully, many thousands and ten, that tens of thousands of assets. So it's going to be important to develop some sort of asset recording system um, where we can uh, locate, measure, and go back to structures and interventions that have been put into place to find them again, uh, start to manage and maintain those systems, and also start to think about how we take those into account within our flood risk assessments and modeling. Next slide, please. Just want to spend a few moments thinking about advice and guidance. Um, we know that the vast majority of existing NFM is currently uh, built either by landowners or their contractors or by environmental NGOs. And they're an incredibly important part of the existing natural food management picture. And that means our advice and guidance documents will need to be tailored largely to these audiences. Next slide, please. So we envisage, I guess, three levels of, of, of advice that will be needed. So we'll need the basic introduction, generalist farm business advice, um, intermediate technical advice, what to build where, um, don't put it there, put it here. So bespoke um, technical spatial advice, maybe based upon existing, um, existing mapping, such as surface flow maps, um, the existing NFM opportunity mapping, but also some of the larger cases will need this bespoke advice uh, for complex agreements and permitting and construction. Next slide, please. Guidance uh, will be the same. There's already an uh, existing library of technical guidance for uh, lots of actions and lots of <coughs> um, uh, interventions that we know as slow the flow interventions, but we'll need to build that library uh, up so that we create documents that are easy to follow, uh, including maybe um, bespoke designs for individual projects. Um, Syria have put in place a, a large-scale project to develop a um, NFM design manual and it's going to be important to link to some of those existing documents as we move into implementation. So <clears throat> final couple of slides here. Um, how can we blend existing finance for flood risk with ELMS? And this, this is in a sense, the most important slide within the, uh, the presentation. Um, what we've tried to do is look at where uh, our four packages of activity, our four types of NFM, fit within the ELMS um, funding framework and how those fit within our existing flood granting aid or perhaps local levy. And the key, the key benefits of blending this finance will be around the ability to construct the capital interventions, but importantly, to maintain and continue management of these systems in the landscape. And I'm sure we'll hear in the next presentation that one of the key barriers uh, with existing funding and existing projects is the ability to manage and maintain into the long term. And that really is one of the key benefits for ELMS um, taking this approach uh, of intervening at these different scales. For instance, I don't think my own opinion is that large scale engineered schemes will not be funded through ELMS. Um, what we will need to do is use the, uh, the power of those agreements to fund the management of the land into the long term. So final slide here. Um, what lessons can we learn from existing stow the flow type uh, projects and how do we transfer these into ELMS? Compromise with partners and landowners um, is a key consideration. There's no project that I know of 
that has developed systems and structures based upon models, gone into the landscape and been able to complete those as designed on paper without a lot of discussion, a lot of negotiation with the landowners. We still need to keep this quite local. We need to build capacity in farmers and landowners. We want to focus on small and many the cumulative benefit of lots of features, not few and large, and we want to start as upstream as possible. Thank you. Sorry, a bit rushed there at the end. You did a great job, Chris. Thank you. There was a lot in it. Um, it's lovely to. It's really interesting to hear your framing as well of, 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 of the sort of four levels, four different types of scheme. That's really useful, and I think that will be. We'll, we'll come back to that when we come to questions. But we're going to move straight on right now to Steve and Rachel uh, to hear how their works identified a range of incentives and barriers to delivering some of the NFN schemes. So, uh, Rachel Nye has an interdisciplinary background in environmental research and the impacts of flooding, climate change, water quality and, and others. She's been working for JBA for the past five years, focusing on natural flood management, delivering the working with natural processes evidence base for the EA and specific catchment NFM and land use projects. Steve Maslin is the Head of Environment at JBA with 35 years experience in land use, landscape planning excuse me, and environmental management. He's worked closely with pub the public sector for most of those years on plans, strategies and evidence to support policy development. Steve directed and led research projects including DEFRA's Enablers and Barriers to NFM, the Environment Agency's Working with Nature Evidence Base and the Committee on Climate Change's Economics of Land Use Change. I'm going to hand over to Steve and Rachel. Hi everyone, thanks. Um, I'm just going to share my screen right now. Um, so let me know if there's any problems. So I'll get started. Um, so today um, I'm here to talk about the uh, work that JVA did for DEFRA on the barriers and enablers to the delivery of natural flood management. Um, this obviously has a lot to do with the new Elm scheme and sort of where public money is for public goods, as Nikki previ previously said. Um, <clears throat> it's probably important to know that this work wasn't meant to inform Elm. I don't think it was initially meant to inform Elms, but has taken quite a large um, seat in terms of how it could be delivered and sort of the lessons learned from how the delivery of NFM previously worked and in the new system. So just to note here that uh, the final report um, has been published by DEFRA in April, uh, well, just last month, and there's a QR code on here uh, that you can just use to uh, go to the link. Uh, we, could, we could also send you the slides afterwards, or if they'll be sent out later, it's included in there. Um, but that final report includes six appendices, which matches with our methodology, which I'll go through uh, later. So um, this presentation, I'll go through the aims and the research questions uh, very quickly through the methodology, but mostly focus on the meat of the project, which was the key findings uh, by the research questions um, and some of the suggested actions that we've, we've noted from the numerous stakeholders that we've interviewed or spoken to during our uh, year long research. So the aim of this uh, project was to identify what the barriers and enablers, or we also called them facilitators, were to delivering natural flood management. And the four research questions we use to address this um, aim are seen here below. So who are the main stakeholders in delivering these projects? What are the social, regulatory, and or institutional barriers and enablers to delivering those NFM projects? And what are the main enablers and barriers associated with the different funding mechanisms used to deliver these projects? Um, just to start, I uh, thought we would define what barriers and enablers mean. Uh, so barriers are the circumstances or obstacles that prevent communication or progress and enablers are the circumstances that cause positive outcomes to happen or develop. We do often find that when you're talking about barriers, we talk about enablers, they go hand in hand quite regularly. Um, barriers are often overcome by enablers and enablers are often stalled by barriers. Um, so just keep that in mind, they, aren't, they shouldn't be taken in isolation and they should be thought of together because they usually help one another. Um, so the methodology for this research project uh, 
was broken down into six key elements. So the first one being a literature review where we reviewed over 50 re references, including gray literature and peer reviewed. Um, we conducted over 60 stakeholder interviews um, across seven broad categories of landowners and estates, land managers, NGOs, government, um, local communities, funders, land agents, basically a lot of people. Uh, we had three farmer focus groups, uh, two in Leicestershire and one in Yorkshire, between um, four and seven farmers each. Um, we had a landowner deep dive, so it was the focus on the large landowners and the small landowners and sort of their bears and enablers to implementing NFM on their land. Uh, we had a legal analysis uh, because obviously maintenance and liability is quite a large barrier for a number of people to implement NFM on their land, so we wanted to explore that a bit further. Um, and lastly, we had six funding case studies. So we looked at the traditional funding of countryside stewardship, um, to the newer funding pots, such as payments per outcome, the Calder Jail NFM grant, um, some NF more innovative funding mechanisms, such as the Somerset NFM reverse auction and end trade. Um, so you can find the details of each of those six key elements in the appendices of the final report. Um, so as we were completing these six key elements of the method, we started mapping it across the project life cycle. Um, so this is just sort of an initial iteration of what that looks like and we'll dive into this in a lot more detail later. So the first research question, who are the main stakeholders delivering NFM projects and what engagement do they have? Um, so we all know stakeholders are extremely important in the implementation of NFM from conception to delivery to maintenance. Um, and stakeholders and their level of engagement varies for, for every project. Um, through the research and our own experiences, active participation of stakeholders or key stakeholders or even a leader in a community can be the key um, to the success of an NFM project. So here we've just listed 16 of the sort of the most common key stakeholders from local communities to land agents, farmers, landowners, um, to the EAA, SEPA and universities and researchers. Um, and dependent on the scheme and budget, obviously, uh, various levels of engagement will be required for successful delivery. However, landowners and local communities, including farmers, are particularly important to engage early as possible because, um, first of all, it's likely where NFM will be implemented, um, as both Chris and Nikki did say previously. And second, they can provide valuable local knowledge that can help ensure the projects is in everyone's best interest. Um, so I'm not going to stay too long on this first research question, mostly because we'll talk about it um, in more detail in the second and third research question. So we've lumped research question two and three together um, because we want to discuss it through the project life cycle. So what are the barriers and enablers that were experienced during the delivery of NFM projects? Um, and to answer this question, we've summarized these barriers and enablers into a typical project life cycle. Please do note that obviously we've just used a traditional project life cycle. We, rec we recognize that projects, particularly NFM projects, don't necessarily follow this project life cycle. They can sort of start with the fact that there's funding available um, and then move from there or an any other way. So, um, but hopefully this picture uh, helps you can look at it sort of at a wider scale. And because there are too many barriers and enablers to go through in, in detail, we've sort of chosen four um, of each to discuss in a bit more detail. So first I'll talk about barriers. Um, so the first one, modeling. It's often a requirement of large funding pots, such as the EA's traditional FDGIA, so the grant and aid scheme, and other funding sources to provide the confidence that NFM will be effective in that catchment. However, communities that most often turn to NFM, particularly for nuisance floods, or sort of, as Chris was saying, sort of the more frequent smaller floods, may not have the financial funding to hire consultants or complete their own flood modeling. So, it's it's too expensive for them um, and where any funding pot requires modeling inputs the cost time and resources required increase 
increase significantly, potentially leaving smaller organizations in a predicament. So funding is a issue that's brought up in pretty much every conversation we've had about NFM um, and sort of the main topic today. Um, and it's obviously very, very important in the implementation of N NFM. It dictates the feasibility implementation and maintenance and agri-environment schemes such as the countryside stewardship grants are common means by which farmers can and do become involved in implementing NFM, um, such as soil management and woodland planting. However, complications with the countryside stewardship and administration process has been highlighted by interviewees as a barrier to potential wider application um, for NFM to be implemented on farmland. Uh, countryside stu stewardship schemes have been developed have developed a poor reputation in the rural sector caused by ongoing poor performance related to payments, inspections, setting up agreements together with excess evidence requirements and unattractive payment rates. They were further criticized for being inflexible and limited due to the strict time scale constraints and conditions. Schemes last for five years and once an agreement has been confirmed, there was little flexibility to make any changes. So any additional woodland planting they wanted to do was sort of off their own back, even if it did increase the benefits. Therefore, there were often missed opportunities to implement NFM measures, which may have been omitted during the early stages um, of NFM. The third one I wanted to talk about was um, inflexible agri-environment schemes. I mean, we talked about that a little bit in the previous uh, barrier, but um, this one's more specific to uh, the countryside stewardship. So there aren't many stewardship options that are focused on NFM other than SW12 right now. So that's making space for water, which has limitations on account of eligibility requirements. So the capital works are required to be implemented in the first two years of the agreement. However, it was reported that there are frequently delays to the confirmation of project agreements. So for example, in 2018, many agreements that were due to start on the 1st of January were not officially confirmed until June. So farmers were therefore losing out on large proportions of the initial two year timeframe to complete capital works, which can have knock on effects. Uh, for the rest of the bus business and there are often cash flow issues as many have said. This combined with that onerous and uh, onerous application process which requires a vast amount of paperwork as many had stated was a common issue of late and a common issue of late payments leads farmers being put off by the process altogether. Um, many even said that Farmers who work part time as land agents or surveyors struggled with the complicated application process. Uh, these burdens, often deemed by the farmers, outweighed any potential benefits and just weren't worth the effort. The last one I wanted to discuss was um, uncertainties around future maintenance requirements. So, at present, countryside stewardship grants and most other types of NFM funding are focused on the development and initial capital works, which leaves any future maintenance costs arising from the measures to be covered by the farmer or landowner. Also, funding availability is often short term, linked to initiative or program, and not matched with the life cycle of the NFM measure. I mean, this has to do with the infant, well, I wouldn't say infancy, but sort of the beginnings of um, the uptake of NFM. So this, this barrier may change in the future. There were many concerns over the lack of funding or facilitation for maintenance, which could result in the measure being scrapped later, reversing any environmental or flood benefits gained. The issue of maintenance and liability for the NFM measures were brought up on a number of occasions dependent on the scale and location. So it's sort of the larger scale um, and more engineered works that seem to have this issue of maintenance and liability, uh, such as engineered leaky dams that were staked or pinned um, because they felt that, yeah, maintenance and liability could pose a barrier to implementation. Whereas those working on sort of smaller scale schemes uh, felt that issues and potential risks were often overplayed and exaggerated. So next I'll talk about some enablers or facilitators to NFM projects. 
So the first one's very popular um, and could get almost everyone to have more confidence in the effectiveness of NFM um, is evidence and demonstration sites. Working demonstration sites have been crucial to gain buy-in from farmers in many cases. Um, these early engagement and uptake of one farmer in a catchment has allowed for highly effective engagement with other farmers later in the process who are able to see for themselves how NFM would conceivably look and work on their own land. So this, this is a great quote that we've taken from one of our interviewees. We were won over by the empathetic Rivers Trust approach, which seduced us into taking modest first steps. Um, and their staff was from our local farming families and respected our position. Um, as we learned to enjoy doing NFM work, they have enabled us to become more radical and scale things up. So this means that not only did it encourage the farmer to, to start introducing NFM onto their land, but the more trust that they gained, the more willing they were taking, to, uh, willing to take that risk and try new things. Um, the second facilitator I'd like to talk about is local knowledge from local people. Um, it's one of the best ways and reasons to deliver NFM projects. As we all know, NFM projects differ from site to site. Not one is the same and shouldn't be treated so. Um, but by engaging locally, the project can start to understand the location, the business operation of the land, um, the family, even the history um, of that family and the impact that their, their family trying different land management or land use techniques might have. So engaging with, um, engaging and working with local communities and a bottom up approach um, where a lot of NFM schemes have come from. Um, is generally a successful approach and they'll increase more buy-in from the start. The third one, um, as NFM uptake increases, there are new and innovative approaches um, to accessing funding and schemes such as auctions and payments. Um, I think Steve will talk about that a bit more uh, later. The last one is uh, the most important, a coordinated approach with joined up thinking. So this often comes from the barrier where NFM schemes often have too many cooks, occasionally leading to a breakdown of relationship between farmer and landowner and the authority in the community. Um, however, as we've seen in the quote before, organizations such as the Rivers Trust and, e and the Farmers Network have consistently been named as the key organizations who have taken responsibility for engaging empathetically and successfully with farmers. So using that approach will be helpful and having regular face-to-face -face meetings um, is a great way to help implement NFM. Oh, sorry. Um, Steve, I'll pass it to you. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Uh, well, you'll do the slides as we move on. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to pick up just uh, now um, uh, on a couple of the barriers there. When we set off to do the research, uh, we part of the methodology didn't really, uh, we didn't really consider that we needed any sort of legal sort of advice within it, but it became apparent uh, as for the reasons that Rachel's already outlined that so there was a number of issues related to sort of responsibilities, regulations, um, a lot of this about contractual responsibilities because we're, it, it involved assets, new assets being built on land uh, and it required them to be maintained and managed. So added to the research, um, we we did include on the um, and the next slide just outlines uh, some of the issues that we began to address. Uh, we never got to the bottom of them; they were actually listed there uh, and, uh, um, as as issues that needed uh, some re resolve to make that sort of step change in 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 the adoption of NFM measures. Uh, as a public benefit on, on private land, you know, who owns the structures, how long are those structures required to be remain on the land, who's liable to maintain them, who's liable for the loss of damage if, if those structures you so inadvertently cause additional flooding or, or hazards um, and can, you know, what happens if a, a landowner changes their mind or the land ownership changes. Um, so um, the, we, we had a legal expert um, work with us uh, in a small part and, uh, and part of that forms part of the final report. 
Um, so I, I'd like to just move on now to the uh, final research question, which was around the funding. Uh, what are the main enablers and barriers um, to the different funding mechanisms? Um, it, it's not uh, funding regimes, it's funding mechanisms. So we looked at uh, these and I'll just quickly go through these as we run through time. We, we didn't look at um, a split between public and private funding. That was not one of the key areas of research. Uh, although we did collect data and information around that, um, most of the NFM measures is is public uh, purse funded. Although there is a huge amount of community in uh, which you might class as private funding contributions to a huge number of the projects, um, and, and some of the water companies are particularly um, uh, involved in, in in developing work. Um, and there's some interesting novel funding um, approaches out there involving crowdfunding, for example, the Ulls Water. But if I just take you through the ones that we, we, we concentrated on, um, countryside stewardship, I'd just like to add at this point, just to give you a sense, everybody a sense of scale here. Um, um, there are 217,000 approximately farms um, in the UK, of which there's about 130,000 um, farms in England, and only 31 of those 130,000 farms um, had entered into a countryside stewardship agreement involving um, uh, NFM measures. So that gives you a, um, a sort of scale of the issue um, and the number of individual farms that will be involved in ELMS, and it also gives you a uh, an impression on um, how countryside stewardship has effectively or unaffectively really um, um, managed to uh, uh, build NFM um, capacity. Um, I mean, the main issues with countryside stewardship, we've already been through, through these are, you know, not specifically targeted at NFM, although SW12 is uh, complex application forms, um, considerable delays to farmers and land managers in receiving payments is a is a perennial issue uh, and a lack of on the ground guidance available um, so the next one um, we looked at was um, a payments for outcomes uh, approach um, and these are two trials one by the national trust and one by the Yorkshire Dales. these were very interesting and, and really precursors of uh, of elms um, the barriers that were uh, came were being revealed through the work is difficulties to uh, determining the exact value of those benefits and, and Chris has uh, explained that in the first presentation um, and again particularly because these were pilots I think there was a the need for a significant advisor input right at the start of these um, but they 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 are delivering value for money um, in terms of from the landowners and farmers perspective. Um, moving on, the DEFRA 15 million uh, initiative um, uh, was, uh, there was a big take up of that and it's delivered a, a lot of NFM schemes. The, certainly the, the, the traditional DEFRA grant, uh, the barrier was the one of the barriers to it was the evidence necessary in the application stage, a number of failed applicants, as it were, or, or um, organisations who didn't proceed um, ev provided evidence on that for us. Um, so um, I shall quickly move on to the Somerset reverse auction, which was an interesting funding um, regime. Uh, reverse auctions um, in these, uh, this was a, a scheme mainly for soil management and um, agricultural land management. Um, but the farmers, or the, these, uh, the, the reverse auction is they 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 put a price in uh, to undertake these works on their land. It was very very popular. It's a very interesting um, sort of mechanism, and I think the the quotes on this were that the auction style strikes a chord with with the farmers as it's an appropriate language that they actually understand it's more like their traditional market as it were so that was an interesting novel way of funding it i i'd, I'd like to probably just wrap up with the last slide rachel on that suggested actions because i think we're running out of time um, I just highlighted three suggested actions here that uh, have been put forward to us 
from interviewees, a better financial delivery system that considers the needs of longevity, and uh, that's a recurring three theme through Chris's and Rachel's presentation. Um, um, providing farmers and land managers with face-to-face -face guidance, specifically tailored to the context of their farm businesses, was uh, a key recommendation from the landowners um, and ensuring a better, more joined up approach between the different agencies, landowners and farmers um, were, were, were key recommendations that were, were, were coming out time and time again through the research. So Rachel, can you just close off with that? Hi, yes, yeah, sorry, I know Nick, you were running really late, but just um, a note that uh, DEFRA have taken some of our suggestions on board um, and they are looking to sort of create a hub of information or a knowledge hub. Um, and they're looking to, from the back of our research, to um, speak to more landowners and farmers. Uh, so please do get in touch with us, or I know uh, the survey at the very end, you can just pop in your email address and it'll get sent to us. So if you want to uh, partake in, in any of this later, if you're a farmer or a landowner, I know some of you have already um, given me your details, so uh, you don't need to do that again. Thank you. Great job, everybody. Uh, and thank you. Uh, yeah, I know we're running a little bit over. We will, we will just extend another five minutes and we'll just switch our timing slightly, but there was so much information in there. So it was it was great to hear. Thank you, guys. Um, I am going to uh, completely not have chairs positive and ask any questions. I think we're going to go straight over to Slido because having been keeping a bit of an eye on it, there's lots of interesting questions coming through. So, and if you're not sure what I'm talking about because you missed the beginning, slido.com and then put in NBS number two. And if you want to ask any questions, that's the best way to do it. And you can see what everybody else is asking. So, um, so Chris, Steve, Rachel, I'm going to uh, just have a look at these and we'll, we'll just get through as many as we can between now and 10.35, I think, if that's okay. Uh, we've got a great view of your fingers there, Chris, so <laughs> I don't know if you're having camera issues. Um, so first one is, does anyone have evidence? And I, I think actually, Rachel, you talked about this being one of the barriers actually around evidence and trials to, to getting this kind of stuff started. So does anyone have any evidence of the carbon sequestration potential of natural regeneration or colonisation? Um, somebody's trying to construct a landowner offer, but carbon's the issue. So um, I don't know who would like to offer any thought. Maybe Chris, actually, is there anything from an EA perspective that you can, you can offer up there? Any thoughts? There's a lot of work. There's a lot of work going on, <clears throat> but there's um, Natural England have, um, have published a report uh, relatively recently about the, um, the carbon sequestration potential of a range of habitats, and um, I can't remember the, the 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 title or provide a citation at the minute. But I found it in a relatively straightforward manner when I was googling around for similar types of products. Um, I imagine it's going to, you know, this is going to be one of the key research questions um, in the near future. Um, so I'd be very surprised if there aren't a plethora of institutions, uh, research uh, and academics <coughs> trying to chase down some of these figures and come up with evidence to support um, land management actions and, and land use change at the minute. But the Natural England report, um, I found to be an extremely good, clear source of information. Thanks, Chris. But maybe that's something if we can afterwards and we do the email out, if we can find that reference, we can add that in actually in case people are interested. Rachel, Steve, from your perspective, <coughs> obviously you did a huge you did a research exercise as part of your work. Is there anything in particular that you um, could add into there? Uh, on the on the soil, well on the carbon sequestration side, uh, there is a huge potential um, for increasing the uh, soil organic matter, and I think that will ultimately uh, deliver carbon sequestration benefits across the, um, in terms of uh, building the carbon store up within the soils. That will deliver better agriculture, and it will also deliver <coughs> NFM through improving soil structural conditions and uh, and um, infiltration. So I think there's a huge potential there, um, uh, and um, on the, certainly on the woodland side as well, uh, riparian woodland. Um, there's some a lot of interesting work going on around riparian woodland and the uh, in terms of NFM benefits. But again, um, sort of hundred year 
potential growth of, of, of trees there and uh, sort of high sequestration rates there. So I think there is a huge potential for these multiple benefits to, to be delivered um, um, through some of the measures that, we're, that we're, we've been talking about and examining today. Um, I'm going to move on, if that's right. Thank you, guys. Um, to the next one. It's wonderful seeing these live. It's great. Thank you for voting and getting engaged with Slido. It's really helpful. So the next one, in light of the drought conditions that we saw in 2019, and uh, as I look out my window in Leeds today, look like they're developing again this year, certainly. Um, surely Elms must support, uh, also support drought risk management techniques. Um, I wonder, wonder what your thoughts are on that, really. Chris, you look like you might want to come in, possibly. Which Chris? Yeah, no, absolutely. There's... Um... Oh, I'm so sorry. There's, there's lots of okay. work. There's lots of work. Go for sorry. it, Chris. <laughs> Lot, lots, of, lots of work going on. Um, uh, we in the EA have just, um, I've been working with my groundwater and water resources colleagues um, on a, a study which JBA completed for us, actually looking at the overlaps and the synergies between the different techniques for NFM and um, drought resistance, infiltration. Uh, and water storage. Um, so there's a huge amount of work going on to look at interventions that supply these multiple benefits. Um, and impermeable catchments, limestone catchments, for instance, um, then most of the NFM techniques are the same techniques that you would want to put in place to um, increase infiltration and, and drive that kind of groundwater recharge. And there's a whole other work stream within Elm, which is looking at... Um, uh, nature-based solutions to support drought risk management techniques. That kind of answers that one beautifully. Thank you. Um, Steve, Rachel, I'm gonna, I'll move on if that's okay, unless you've got anything you particularly wanted to yeah. add to that, because it'd be great to get through a few more, wouldn't it? Okay, uh, so given the impact of urban surface runoff on flooding, is there a case for examining public willingness to restore the porosity to the urban environment? I feel like Chris, we keep coming to you with your EA hat on. I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, yes, yeah, Steve, well, Rachel, if there's anything you want to add, but maybe Chris will come to you first if that's okay. <laughs> oh, Chris, did you want to? There, there's a yeah, no, there's a there's a well, yeah, of course, we need to increase and restore porosity in the urban environment. Um, if we're linking that to Elm, there there are a series of actions which are being discussed for Elm, which would um, which would allow that to happen. Uh, maybe. Uh, we don't yet know whether local authorities, risk management authorities, will be able to apply in to Elm. Um, we haven't come on to that yet. Uh, uh, whether groups or facilitators, um, other than farmers and woodland donors, uh, can apply into the higher tiers of Elm to, to, for exactly this type of work for green infrastructure, um, urban suds, uh, blue green infrastructure kind of storage techniques to increase the porosity of our urban environments. Um, but quick answer is yes, there is a case. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and as somebody who bought a green roof yesterday, I'm feeling like I'm a great advocate for it right now. Got to install it though. Um, right, let's, uh, how are we doing for time? I think we've got a couple more minutes, so we'll keep going. This is great. And thank you for using Slider, everybody. Um, uh, you were earning your money this morning, Chris, aren't you? If only we were paying you. So could Chris tell us how to get hold of the natural flood management opportunity maps? Are they a public resource? Okay, so there's um, maybe the two things being discussed here. The, there's an existing um, product which is held on the JBA website, which is the uh, Work and Natural Processes Evidence Directory and the evidence uh, around some potential opportunity mapping. Um, that's already in place and was, was carried out a number of years ago. Uh, the type of mapping that I showed today, we're still in development. So there's a lot of um, thinking and development uh, going on around producing special priorities for Elm. Um, we're tied into some of that work. And as I said, we think we need to switch around from opportunity to public good and demand um, and find out where the types of techniques will produce the best results and deliver the most public good. So that may be, and thinking of the, uh, the next question, utilizing techniques for water quality, that may be uh, not focusing uh, completely on maximizing flood risk benefits, but where we maximize public goods, such as water quality improvements or nature recovery, alongside some of those other flood risk benefits. And, so, and, uh, short sorry. answer is no, they're not available yet, uh, but they're still in development. 
Great, thank you. Um, and you touched on water quality there. I guess I'm, I'm wondering whether Rachel and Steve, whether you've got any thoughts around um, NFM and, and water quality. It seems like, a, from my relatively layman's perspective, a, a, a almost a, you know, they're almost symbiotic, goes hand in hand really. But what are your thoughts around NFM and, and water quality improvements? Steve, do you want me to jump in, or yeah, you yeah, Rachel, to... you do that. You. Um, well, we often find that NFM has a lot of, a lot of multiple benefits. That's why it's so popular. Um, so, use using NFM, I think, particularly in farm management, helps improve water quality. There's there's actually quite a lot of research um, in the evidence base that we looked at that looked more at water quality than it did at flood regulation. So there is a high amount of evidence that showed that sediment traps and buns, et cetera, can help improve water quality downstream. Um, obviously, you need to think about where you put them um, and how they're constructed uh, because you don't want it to worsen water quality in certain areas rather than um, improve it just downstream. Um, so yeah, I think they they go hand in hand uh, naturally. I don't know if there's anything more you want to add, Chris. No, that's fine. It's fine. So we are almost out of time, but I I would really like to ask the next question because I think it's quite a <laughs> it's quite a crunchy one, I'm afraid, guys. But I think it's really important. So and I'd love to hear your thoughts. So um, and it came up in last week's webinar as well around this piece around you know, maintenance and liability, obviously, because we're dealing with water courses. So that, you know, where the, where the uh, cause might be, the impact might be felt somewhere else. So just, I'd be really interested to know your thoughts. Maybe we start with you, Chris, but as a final sort of just, you know, 30, 40 second response, what do you think about uh, responsibility and liability? Yeah, I think this is why ELM is a game changer for NFM. Um, a lot of, uh, Steve has shown that you know these these things are uppermost in farmers and landowners' minds. The potential for Elm is that we've got a system for the future payment and management of structures and interventions that are put in place for as long as they're needed. Um, so, so in terms of management and maintenance, um, anything funded through Elm should attract that kind of future management and, and, and maintenance payment um, and provide the incentive to keep it in place. Uh, the, the question of liability is, I'm afraid, more complex and um, will depend on a whole range of factors that, that ultimately around uh, who designs them, who builds them, who's advised them, whose land it is, and what's been affected. Personally, I think it's overplayed. Um, the, the actual risk from some of these techniques is smaller than theoretical. Um, but still need, we still need to nail some of those questions and hopefully the development of Elm will provide an opportunity to do that. Great. I think I'm going to close out there, guys, if that's okay. I'm sorry, Rachel and Steve, mm -hmm. to cut you off if you've got responses, but just to keep us to time. We're a little bit over, but I think it was really worth doing because it's really interesting. So uh, thank you, everybody, for, for having that first hour and a bit with us. So I make it 10.37. We're trying to stick to time. So let's say uh, 10.45 to restart, if that's okay. Go and get yourself a brew. And um, we will see you in about seven minutes for part two. Thank you. Thank you. Tristan, are you good to go? Uh, yep, yep. Great, I'll do a quick intro. I just wanted to make sure you were back. That was all Sorry. wonderful, lovely. No, 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 don't apologise at all. Wonderful. Well, uh, welcome back. Hope you've had a chance to uh, grab a brew or whatever you need to do. We're going to get straight on with our second round of uh, presentations for this webinar and then we'll do some questions afterwards. Um, and just as a reminder, keep using Slido MBS2 if you want to ask uh, any questions as we go through and, and then vote on others if you see something that you think you agree with. Uh, so first up we've got Tristan Gallatly from the Forestry Commission. Tristan spent almost 20 years working for the Forestry Commission in both Wales and England and since 2004 as a woodland officer in the Beautiful Peak District. He works on forestry grants and regulations and has worked on a number of local partnership projects to help protect, improve and expand woodlands increasingly in the peaks. This is obviously a highly protected landscape and a lot of work goes into ensuring the right tree is planted in the right place. I'm going to hand over to Tristan. Thanks very much. Um, yes, I've been in the Peak Park for or Peak District area for um, quite a while now. Um, and I just want to talk briefly about um, a sort of history of um, 
woodland creation that we've been funding in the Peak District specifically. Um, so I suppose the Forest Commission have been around since uh, 1919. Um, we've been at this game for a while. This gathers, interestingly, in sort of 1993, um, when the Forest Commission signed a concordat with the National Park Authorities um, on native woodlands in the national parks. It was focused on um, encouraging appropriate management of semi-natural woodland, extending semi-natural woodlands, and then also identifying areas for appropriate to re-establish new native woodland. Um, in 1998, it led to the new native woodland challenge fund in the national parks. Now this was quite a good opportunity actually for, for planting woodland. It was a 100% funding op um, scheme where applicants would apply and put a, a bid in to, do, to deliver X hectares of, of new native woodland. And, and it was, it worked very well, particularly because you were, you know, landowners were confident on the the actual reality of the cost of you know, delivering this planting scheme. Um, as I say, it was a competitive process um, to, sorry, my dogs started acting up, um, whereby um, people would apply to us, we'd make an assessment for the scheme, and then um, it would go to a panel of experts like uh, the National Park Authority, ourselves, um, and other sort of local um, interested parties to make an assessment on which schemes delivered the best value for money. Um, through it, we managed to plant up 250 hectares of native woodland um, between 1998 and 2003. Now, the scheme was very but it was very focused on extending existing Tristan. woodland. Um, yes, yeah, can you hear I'm me? So sorry to interrupt you. It might just be me, but uh, I lost your audio there for a second. I just wonder, um, shout if anyone, if it's just me, guys, but I couldn't hear you. I just wonder if you could just restart that sort of sentence again, if that's okay. Just make okay, sure. sorry. Can you hear me Thank now? You, no? Yeah, sounds fine now. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I've got a very bad internet um, connection here. I've already dropped out once on this scheme, so hopefully I'll keep going. Um, yeah, so with this, so here's some examples of schemes um, that we, we did fund through the Native Woodland um, Challenge. And you can see there's existing woodland and then sort of green areas are extending those, those areas of woodland. Um, we kept it away from um, heather moorland or dwarf shrub heath or anything like that. We certainly didn't plant any areas and, and areas of, of you know we're losing you again sir i'm so sorry to cut over you tristan i'm so oh, sorry we're, we're just losing you again and it's just a real shame I, I wouldn't have you got a 4g connection I'm, I'm wondering whether we just um if we can do something quickly because your video's off already um if if there isn't anything we can do on Wi-Fi, if you've got a 4G, you can maybe connect to if that's likely to be any better. And we could always uh, come to Chris next and then come back to you potentially. Possibly. I'm just trying to think. Can you hear me better on this speaker? Yeah, right. It sounds fine. Yeah, it sounds fine at the moment. Sorry, Jane, go on. Yeah, I was going to say right now it's fine. Um, we could possibly also switch to um, presenting from my side. Let's do that. It, yeah. Let's do that. Sorry for the technical hitch, everybody, but this is this is the new normal, isn't it? So we'll do exactly that. We will um, we'll get uh, Jane to do your slides for you, Tristan. So all you need to do is uh, focus on the audio, and hopefully that will help your broadband okay, cope a little better. So <laughs> right, thank stop... you. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's fine. So if I stop sharing, you yep. can get back yep. in, can you? Let's do exactly that, and then we can just do the audio from you. And if you can just restart right. your last point, that'd be helpful. Thanks for bearing with us, everybody. <laughs> Keep going, Tristan, and Jane will catch you up, if that's okay. Can you hear me now? Yep, sounds hey, good. Good, yeah. that's okay. So, um, yeah, we still, still well clear of triple SIs, SACs, priority habitats. Any applications on, on Heather were rejected. Um, and it was fairly 
it's fairly early days of planting. Um, I want to move on to the next slide. So we finished with the Woodland Grant Scheme and now we're moving on to um, the English Woodland Grant Scheme. This started around sort of 2007, it was the next Rural Development Plan. Um, I think this was a golden time in, in our forestry grant aid. It was, pretty, it was a pretty simple scheme to work with actually. Um, it's fairly steady uptake in, in Derbyshire um, for sort of smaller schemes but most of the sort of applications we got in the Peak Park in the early stages of the EWGS um, were sort of small corners of fields, little bits of unproductive land, um, um, and that sort of raised a few nerves because there was probably, if it was unproductive, there was probably already some sort of habitat interest in those areas. So National Park Authority were a little bit nervous about some of the schemes that we got in in the earlier days. But eventually the grant rates picked up um, to something that was a bit more realistic in terms of helping landowners change from a from an agricultural land use on a on a parcel of land to a to a woodland creation scheme, so it became much more um, more attractive for landowners towards the end of the EWGS in sort of um, 2012, 13, 14 period, um, and it was then that we started um, a project called the Clough Woodland Project. Before I move on to the next slide, you can see, and those of you who are not familiar with the South Pennines, these are the sort of cloughs, these little steep sided valleys or um, sort of stream sides. And they're the sort of patches where the sort of remnants of native woodland were left in the, in the, in the dark peak, especially in the National Park. Um, and so a lot of people were, were keen to do some to some more woodland creation, particularly in those cloughs. So if we have the next slide. Yeah, um, so the Clough Woodland Project started, it was, uh, it was initially funded with the Environment Agency and the Forestry Commission, and it was led by Moors for the Future, who traditionally they've stayed up on the blanket bog, you know, SAC protection, um, restoring blanket bog in the South Pennines. Um, and, but they're, they're very good at delivering, you know, project-based um, schemes really. And we found them very, very helpful for um, sort of targeting where we could be doing some more work and really ramping up the, the woodland creation um, that we could do in the, in the, in the National Park. Um, you can see the map on the on the left is a sort of uh, an assessment of the potential in the dark peak area and um, the green areas are focused uh, effectively steep sided land um, away from blanket bog where there was potential for planting woodland and then the the, the red areas are um, where there's a benefit for water framework directive and the blue areas um, were for flood risk management. Um, and there's a sort of purple color as well where they did both. So you can see there's a sort of higher up in the catchment, there was a sort of good potential to do some work up in that, that sort of particular area, um, higher up in the catchment and get some work done. So we focused our work up there. Now, this is obviously, you know, really super protected landscape. It's triple SI, um, special area conservation, special protection areas, it's in the National Park. There's all manner of priority habitats um, on, you know, in and around this area. So for us to um, bring people on board and those consultees on board that basically we want to plant, you know, some significant areas of planting, but we don't want to, you know, we're aware of the issues on, you know, in general in these areas. So we produced something called this, this guiding principles for the Clough Woodland Project, which basically said, if we plant in a wood, you know, we're planting a woodland here, um, we'll take care not to plant on wet flushes um, for the habitat interest, or if there's dwarf shrub heath, we'll plant at a lower density, or if there's blanket bog, we clearly won't be planting on, on that sort of area. Um, and we would avoid planting on that. So it was sort of a way of helping with the consultation process and making sure that all the various NGOs and um, other consultees that, you know, would be confident that we were doing something very sensible and, and, and it was going to be successful. 
Uh, if you move to the next slide. So this is um, um, an example of you know a, the big the big application within the Clough Woodland projects. Um, submitted by the National Trust um, around the Derwent Reservoirs. Um, you can see the conifer plantations that belong to Seven Trent Water around the reservoirs themselves. And then the National Trust own um, the wider catchment around there. So it was on the National Trust that there was the you know, greatest potential for planting new woodland. A lot of it was in cloughs blending, and hopefully it will be blending the conifer plantations in with the landscape as well. Um, this scheme was applied for, they applied for 480 hectares of new native woodland. Um, approximately 300 hectares was delivered um, with some additional sort of scrub creation as well, um, sort of blending in those, those, those planting areas. Um, so it took, took some lengthy negotiation, you know, with, with farm tenants, um, RSPB, National National Park Authority, um, making sure that we didn't plant on any archaeological features or check the ecology, ecological features that are on site and everything else. But, um, you know, it was a really successful scheme. Um, and, um, yeah, you can see how it goes. So next slide. Let's see some examples of planting areas. So here you can see with this scheme, you know, it, it was bold because we were planting on triple SI. So it took a lot of consenting through that sort of, um, that's that process. Um, and we had to make sure that natural England were confident that we weren't going to be damaging any blanket bog features beyond or wading bird habitat and things like that. Um, so we, we focused on the escarpments. We tried to keep it below the break of slope. Um, the picture on the left is actually a sort of concept photo so you can see a few trees dotted up on the top of the, the scarf the break of slope but most of it was planting in tubes um, adjacent to the conifer plantations and these trees are starting to establish quite well now and um, you know and we're starting to get that 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 blend of native woodland going off to a sort of productive conifer plantation and and things are working quite well um next slide yeah i just wanted to talk um as i already said this is like super protective landscape that we were we were pushing woodland creation in um and we had to be aware that you know this is internationally designated spa sac it's under the habitats regs so we had to, this is how we sort of demonstrated that if we plant up these areas, you know, we would map the, the, any dwarf shrub heath or acid flushes um, and then map where the acid, where the bracken areas are and the acid grassland areas are, any archaeological features where we want to um, avoid planting. And that way we could demonstrate where we're putting the fences and also, you know, the potential within the scheme for planting up you know, the bracken areas and the acid grassland, particularly where there's sort of less, um, um, in, you know, environmental or ecological interest in those areas. Um, and, you know, this was very much, you know, informed by our sort of guiding principles process that everybody signed up to at the beginning of the, of the agreement, really. Um, and this is just you know, an example of, of, of what it took to get each site through. Um, so next slide. Yeah, yeah. I think if you move on to the next one, we'll ignore that one for a bit. I want to talk about countryside stewardship. So we've heard countryside stewardships. There's a lot of paperwork, and it's not the easiest scheme to apply for, it's certainly not as easy as the English Wooden Ground Scheme was to apply for, or even um, even the new Native Woodland Challenge actually. Um, but in fairness to the woodland creation element um, 
of countryside stewardship. It's a generous grant. You know, it pays up £6,800 per hectare towards the establishment costs, pays £200 a hectare towards the maintenance for ten per year for, for 10 years. Um, it is targeted on, you know, biodiversity gains, which similar to what we've been doing before, but it's also including the water quality and flood risk benefits. So it's, you know, and it's, it's flexible. I think, you know, for a planting design, you can make it work for whatever the landowner's, you know, objectives are in most cases. Um, unfortunately, it only pays for planting costs and fencing costs. It doesn't cover the cost um, for natural regeneration, which um, is a shame. But, you know, it's the, the real benefit, I think, is it's it's flexible in terms of planting densities that you can use so it's very attractive for sort of upland wide spaced patchy scratchy planting but also you can have small schemes adjacent to water courses um, you know down to like 0.1 of a hectare in size or block size um, and you know one hectare scheme in total if you're if you're doing something to benefit water quality for diffuse pollution or shading that sort of thing um, or reducing flood risk benefit uh, or benefiting the flood risk potential for a site. So you can get away with, you know, quite a lot within the scheme. Um, there is a lot of paperwork, I'm afraid, but um, um, yes, it's not great progress that way, I think. So if we move to the next slide. So here's an example of um, a quite a hefty planting scheme that was done through countryside stewardship with the RSPB. And you can, I, hopefully you can see on this, the tree tubes are really quite wide spacing. You can see the habitat, the sort of draw shop heath interest in there. And then there's bracken areas where the planting is more dense. Um, and we're hoping to do, you know, some quite significant planting schemes along that sort of line with countryside stewardship. And at the moment we're waiting for elms to come live, but actually, particularly for woodland creation, you know, stewardship's quite a good scheme. Um, and, you know, we, we've got, um, you know, good potential, particularly in the peak part, to do, to do more sort of thing. So I'm sort of encouraging people as much, as strong as we can to, to apply now for, for woodland creation things. And it shouldn't prejudice any ELMS, future ELMS funding later on, I think, with a bit of luck. Um, the problems we've had particularly with stewardship um, is, you know, the national park is a significant area of triple SI. It's kind of saturated cover with agro-environment HLS agreements. So it does take a lot of digging out of an, you know, if you want to plant up an area like this, you know, it does take a lot of digging yourself out of the HLS agreement for this particular area that you're planting. Um, but it's not beyond possibility, you know, and, and Natural England and Forest Commission, everybody would, would help you, you know, get through that process, um, particularly for a new native woodland or for a, for a planting scheme um, to make it work. Um, Kristen, I am so sorry to cut across you, but we are um, perilously close to running short of time. I wonder if I could just ask you to make a few concluding remarks, if that's, I've if that's just okay. got one more slide. Great, just thank one you. more slide and that'll be it. So next slide. So I suppose what I wanted to get across was, you know, the progress we've made, which is moving from, you know, avoiding triple SIs, avoiding um, any dwarf shrub heath or heather or anything planting like that in, you know, Native Woodland Challenge Fund. We got bolder through the English Woodland Grant Scheme and we planted on triple SI and SPA and SAC. And, you know, this is all doable, you know, and, and we've got some really exciting projects in this part of the world where we've done it. And now, you know, with stewardship, we've got, um, the potential for an application where, where with EWGS we've stepped, said we won't go beyond the break of slope, we'll stop at that, you know, well below the escarpment. But now we're looking at, you can see the picture on the top right, that sort of, those eroded peat hags that are over the edge. And what we're really interested in doing is whether we can fund through countryside stewardship or ELMS longer term, ways of stabilizing those peat hags. And so this picture on the left hand um, this map on the left hand side that shows a potential application we've got coming in where you've got traditional woodland creation in the blue going beyond up to the top of the escarpment in that sort of 
orange hash area. And then now we're talking about willow scrub being planted in the deep fissures through the peat. And that's a real problem in particularly in the South Pennines where you have atmospheric erosion where the peat is eroded down to bare, bare mineral soil in these fissures. And finding natural ways using you know willow scrub to kind of stabilize those those fissures and block those grips. Um, and if anybody is aware of Richard Lindsay's model, like Blamange model, it's well worth looking up. And that's talking about using trees, stabilized peat hags and peat edges. And that's it. Great, thank you. Uh, sorry to sorry to rush you, but uh, keen that we, we give everybody plenty of air time really. And um, we've got some interesting questions coming through. A few people have asked um, for the Slido code, which is, so slido.com nbs uh, november bravo sierra number two so if you've got any questions um, i know some of the questions are still in there from the first session so we'll we'll skip past those don't worry and we'll make sure the ones that we ask are pertinent to our current speakers so without further ado let's move on to our final speaker from for today who is chris jones from the beaver trust chris is a farmer from mid cornwall and director of the beaver trust he's been very interested in the area of ecosystem services and building resilience to climate breakdown and i'm going to hand straight over so chris over to you Okay, first off, can you hear me? Yes, we can. It's a little patchy, but we can at the moment, yeah. Okay. Right, now I've got to be able to see if I'm... Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, my observations really here. Um, slides seem to be all over the bloody place. Okay, so I'm an organic livestock farmer, partner in Cornwall Beaver Project and a director of Beaver Trust. We are facing increasing climate chaos, more intense, wet, dry, and windy periods. And our rivers and landscapes are not resilient, resilient to this. Uh, we have, I would put it, hardly any ecologically sound uh, water courses in this country at all, uh, regardless of the water framework directed definition, which is not up to scratch. Um, the Beaver Project in Cornwall came about following flooding in Laddock. Okay, it's a mile downstream of us. I was a parish councillor at the time, and I was very interested in finding out how I could hold more water on our land. We had a lot of advice from the EA about this, and uh, we walked all around it. Um, uh, a lot of prescriptions from them, absolutely no uh, resource at all to do any of it, or more critically, to maintain it. So beavers were an obvious low choice cuss for us, and we began to pursue that option. So there is a Eurasian beaver. There are genuine keystone species, very few of those around. If we don't have them, all sorts of things fall apart, including our waterways. They're an ecosystem engineer, very large animal, about 20, 25 kilos as, as an adult, herbivorous. Highly territorial, and this has great um, importance for us in uh, how they work to produce the kind of effects we want. They would much rather, being lazy like we are, live in a place where they've got deep enough water to have a, a concealed um, entrance to their lodge, but they will alter very readily suboptimal habitat to suit their needs. And this is where the magic starts, when they get into headwaters. they create wetland and dams. Okay, currently we've had about 18 years of trialing of them. Lots of uh, a study on the hydrology, a lot of it done by Exeter University and um, any uh, data that I share today will be basically stuff that Exeter have done with us. Thank you. I'm just gonna wish to these because um, the more meaty things to talk about as we go along. They are very readily managed if we choose to do so, so and cheaply managed. It is time that we got these animals back out there. They're already there in uh, four or five river catchments across the country in small numbers, but those numbers are growing. Um, they will be everywhere eventually on the current trajectory, but 
do we have time to wait the centuries that's going to take or should we rather than sitting on our asses actually get going and bring these animals back properly uh, we estimate less than one percent of the annual flood budget over the next 10 years would see them back across the country uh, and uh, money in place to actually uh, have local management as well okay across europe there's a million and a quarter nowadays uh, that number is steadily growing uh, as you see at the bottom britain has uh, very few uh, and currently we're shooting lots of them in scotland because of uh, a poorly devised management practices so we brought them back in uh, in june of uh, 2017 two days after they arrived or two mornings after they arrived we saw this on the outflow from their pond and over the next few days they produced a really quite creditable dam but not just one dam two because there's a second outflow just out of picture and they dammed that up as well Three years on, we have eight dams, two lodges. We've got, instead of about 1,000 cubic meters of water on, on the site, we've now got about 3,000 cubic meters being held there all the time. The stream is braiding. Um, we've now got two streams that run the length of the site. Uh, and arguably you could say we've got three but the other one is more more a uh, seep but that will increase as the years goes by i think there is definite separation in the hydrograph that happened really really quickly and has been continuous time goes by really critical uh, i saw there's some questions earlier about drought we had spare water here we could pump out onto a pasture in 2018 quite handy if you're a farmer and we're getting lots of new species on, on the site as well. Okay, so this was the hydrograph for a period uh, before the beavers came. The red line is water leaving the site, the blue line is water entering. Note that the blue and red lines are almost sim simultaneous. So the, the, the peak in and the peak out are almost exact at the same time. And the uh, red line is always higher. Now, the beavers were back for 10 weeks before we had significant rain and in that 10 week period they produced four dams and created a number of pools straight away we can see a, a profound drop in the size of the peak leaving and a, prof a, a profound attenuation so this led me to think of the site as a water battery before the beavers came the battery was broken i.e you could charge it up really quickly and it discharged straight away the beavers have been back doing their work and the battery almost immediately began to repair itself. I charged up just as quickly, but was discharging more slowly. Uh, here's another period. This is about uh, uh, 15 months later, a profound change in the flood peak. This is a, a slide just showing um, uh, from a drone map. This is how the site was before. Note the original pond and a stream running away from it. This was this year, just before the uh, lockdown. And you can see uh, a, a dramatically changed picture in terms of uh, surface water storage. And you can see, or rather you can't see, under the trees to the north of the main pond, there's another pond forming uh, under a canopy as well. And there's uh, a... Uh, uh, you can just about see a second water course forming there on the north side as well. This is huge. And by the way, apart from the nausea of having to produce a fence, has been free. This has not cost anybody anything. So this is our stream uh, yesterday. Uh, looking lovely, you can see, uh, if you use your imagination a little bit, the water is uh, trickling through the dam itself. And also if you look at the bottom left, you can see the surface channel there coming around the dam. So uh, a good bit of evidence of braiding there. This was what it looked like during Storm Dennis uh, in February. Now, believe me, that's a hell of a lot of water there, but that was slowed down considerably uh, to what it would have been if we had not had these dams there. This is just some flow data from Exeter. Um, no beavers uh, is the red, uh, red line and blue beavers is the blue line. And if you look at the actual flow, 
it has been reduced by about 50% on average. And that is across hundreds of rainfall events. So we're taking that as a, pretty much a successful bit of natural flood management. And this is why the, their dams work so well and why we, we would really struggle to do, to do anything as good. There's the, the obvious uh, structure made of sticks or uh, mostly of sticks, but behind the dam, the beavers are constantly, constantly on a daily basis, pushing up mud and stones and debris behind. So the dam itself, where it is deepest, it is also thickest. And uh, the, the dams that we have, certainly on our main pond, which are now, uh, the dams are about one and a half meters tall, the width of the dam at the base is more like five and six meters. So these are incredibly strong structures uh, and incredibly good at holding back water, even in very, very strong uh, storm conditions. Um, I have seen people come to us, actually from JBA Consulting that happened, and have a quiet weep when they saw this, because they said we could never, ever, ever uh, reproduce that in quite the same way. Right, it's really critical that we get beavers quickly to the right places in our watercourses, and that means headwaters. They can't really do much uh, in deeper water because the water is too deep and too strong for them to dam. But they can be right across our upper catchments if we want to boost them. Into They're going to get there anyway, but it's going to take hundreds of years. <clears throat> it's very, very cheap and effective to bring them back. We estimate let us around about half a percent of the flood budget and uh, nothing like the 50 million pounds which is currently being spent on nfm and to be honest i'm getting a little bit bored of uh, every time there's a, a big flooding season having the high price punters from the government uh, stand up and say oh of course we have to fix our headwaters we have to fix our landscapes we have to do this we have to do that and frankly although there's some really good things going on which have been illustrated today it is not systemic and we need to get systemic about this if we're taking uh, uh, the uh, future uh, climate seriously. If we're not, fine, just leave it more or less like it and do a little bit now and again here and there. <clears throat> Finally, it's not just about flooding. It's about drought resilience, it's been mentioned. It's about removing agricultural pollutants and silt and a general return of our headwaters to ecological integrity. Beavers are meant to be here. They should be here, and they're going to be here one way or the other, but do we have the guts to actually uh, take that forward? They fight climate change. Look, this is actually from the USA, but this could easily be a part of our uplands, which are getting more and more prone to fire. They provide uh, fire breaks and refuges for wildlife, and indeed livestock too, if there was any there. Uh, we shouldn't underestimate that the uh, importance of that. Okay, I, I've rattled that really, really quickly, but uh, I thought it best if we had a lot of time for Q&A on this, because it is a big thing. It does require a change in mindset. Uh, someone said to me once, if you want to change things a little bit, just change the way you do things. If you want to change things a lot, start to see things differently. And if we can learn to love and accept another decision maker in our countryside, we can really do well with these animals. The country deserves it, they deserve it, and so do we. Thank you very much. Chris, thank you. And thank you for uh, doing that at such a pace. It was really, it was really interesting. It's really helpful because, as you say, it does give us a little more time for some of the Slido questions. So uh, Jane and the Cyrim team have been busily uh, trying to filter out the ones that are pertinent to this. So whilst I'm just waiting for them to do that, um, there's just one question that I would like to ask for yourself and Tristan, actually, I'm hoping Tristan is, uh, has not been mauled by the dog and is still available for us. Um, so you mentioned in your talk, um, Chris, there's been some concern expressed about beavers being culled potentially in Scotland. There's obviously a balance that we need to strike between letting nature do entirely what it wants and how it interfaces with, with us. Um, in your opinion, where are we in terms of understanding where that balance lies? Um, are there any downsides to beaver reintroduction? And, and I guess, you know, is that driving the concern in Scotland? And specifically, Tristan, for you, um, are there any downsides in the kind of woodland creation in the areas that you've been working in? Is, is this otherwise unproductive land? So uh, if you can have a think about that and then we'll move to the Slido questions. That'd be great. So maybe Chris, yeah. Yeah, I would like to say, Nikki, that um, uh, there are 
definitely impacts of uh, beaver presence, which can be seen as, as a downside or a conflict. Um, but they are relatively easily managed. And um, th there are relatively uh, uh, simple techniques that we can, we can use, uh, which are not expensive. You know, in Bavaria, there's something like 25,000 beavers currently. They shoot about 1,000 a year. The population is still growing. Um, uh, and uh, their, their whole beaver management program, which involves all sorts of small interventions when they are needed, um, is costing about half a million euros a year. Now, in terms of a flood budget, that is nothing. And that is in a very, very um, uh, intensively managed landscape. So uh, there are all sorts of things to do. They, 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 they cut down trees, they um, create local flooding, uh, that they, they uh, can block drainage ditches, all sorts of things they can do, but they're really, really easily managed. Uh, and um, a, a suite of uh, techniques can be used to do that, up to and including lethal control. We shouldn't be afraid of that. But why, why I think that the, the tragedy of Scotland is they're killing uh, 100 beavers a year or, or whatever the numbers are, when they could so easily be moved somewhere else, caught and moved somewhere else. They didn't go in, uh, extinct in this country because they were hard to catch. You know, we should remember that. Mm. That's really helpful. Thank you. And Tristan, are, are you there, by the way? I'm hoping you are. Can you hear me? Yes, yep, still here. Oh, fantastic. So uh, thinking about the kind of um, uh, the kind of woodland creation that we, we looked at and um, and maybe that brings us on to Matt's first question around the Clough Woodland project, actually. Are there any downsides to the to the woodland creation work that you've been that you've been doing? Um, I'd say, I mean, I'd be pretty biased in terms of, you know, woodland creation is pretty, I think it's, you know, pretty fantastic but um you know it really de genuinely delivers multi-purpose benefits whether that's habitat creation or it retaining existing habitat interest but also you know helping with percolation and you know water quality issues and things like that so you know as a as a job i think it's or you know as doing the work i think it's a, a really important you know contribution towards you know the wider landscape um, I think some tenant farmers, you know, particularly on the, the National Trust scheme, were concerned about losing the shelter within those cloughs. So imagine, so a lot of the stock spend their summer in the Cheshire Plain, and then they come up onto the moors for the, sorry, the winter in the Cheshire Plain, they come out in, into the summer on the moors, where it's still pretty windy and, and hateful for a good bit of the year. Um, so they spend a lot of their time sheltering in these cloughs, um, and, you know, the steep-sided area sort of thing so it's it's retaining at least some shelter within a, a landscape for for stock to use until the trees are there to provide that shelter longer term sort of thing so it takes it takes a landowner a while to get around to making that commitment you know and and you know to be because it's 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 a big commitment changing from agriculture to forestry so it, you know it, it takes a while so it's difficult yeah. No, thank you. And I think hopefully, Matt, that's answered your question to a degree as well. I'm going to just conscious of time, going to keep us moving if that's OK. So we'll move on to Ed's question. Typically, how far from the watercourse does beaver activity cause a, an impact and effect? How much space um, is needed, I guess, really? Thanks. This brings me on to elms, which I didn't mention, I think, throughout, throughout my little gallop through. Um, uh, I would maintain that elms needs to be focused really systemically. And what are the big things we need to look after? We need to look after water and carbon. If we have, uh, as a measure, a compulsory 20 meter uh, uh, buffer around all watercourses on either side of them, that will take out an awful lot of the potential for conflict with agriculture. Uh, beavers tend not to move far from water because it is their safety blanket and refuge. So they, you know, they live in a world of, of wolves and bears and lions and tigers. They're afraid of being out of water, and so they won't go very far unless they really, really have to. Um, so uh, uh, relatively narrow buffers, uh, which are left more or less to natural process, and either scrubbing up or indeed even uh, with some planting of uh, uh, trees, will be adequate to keep most of the conflict with them uh, to, a, to an absolute minimum. Um, and uh, I think a, a river buffer would be something uh, that any landowner or, or farmer would be able to embrace 
as being a fairly sensible thing because if you have it such, such that uh, there, there is no cultivation and no chemistry applied in that, there would seem to be a, 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 lot, to, a lot going for it. And of course, doing that is good for carbon too. Um, I've got this horrible feeling we, we tend to overcomplicate and overprescribe, and we need to stop doing that and actually begin to look at the fundamental systems that we're trying to help. Yeah, thank you, Chris. That's really helpful. Um, so interestingly, on Slido, we've got a question about plastic waste, uh, the tree guards, I guess, really, from, from, uh, from the woodland schemes. And then on the, on the chat, I'm seeing some debate uh, in the alternative version, uh, the alternative view, uh, talking about why we need them. So I'm going to put all of that to you, Tristan, from your perspective. It's obviously, it has an impact on the landscape. There's a lot of plastic out there. I'm sure they're there for a reason as well. What are, you, what are your thoughts? It feels like there's a lot of debate happening around, around the... Um, the tubes. Yeah, I've I've some sympathy with this. Um, they're, they're increasingly becoming, um, you know, an essential way of delivering planting, you know, to a site. Um, you know, and they do help with tree establishment, and they definitely are, you know, required in many many instances. Um, I've got a scheme where they're looking at trialing sort of biodegradable tubes that hopefully they can leave on site, and you know, they're not they're not anyway plastic. They're kind of a cardboard. They're almost like egg boxes, but a bit more sustainable, uh, a bit more rigid than that. Um, so at the moment, they're all we've really got to play with. Um, and you've got to look at it in terms of, well, yeah, we're putting some tubes in here for the next five years or so, with a bit of luck, maybe a bit more in, in the uplands. Um, and then it is a question of getting them off the site and either reusing them elsewhere if they're still in good enough nick. Um, but it's... Yeah, they don't look very pretty for the first five years, certainly. Um, and, and it is important that they're pulled off as well. But actually, the tubes are better than the spiral guards, which break down and get sort of left on site. Because whilst they're sort of, they, they break down in the sun, so that, you know, they break down in smaller bits, but you're basically leaving that plastic on site. Whereas at least the tubes, you can, you can pull them off and get them off. Interesting. No, thank you. Um, we are perilously short of time, I'm and I feel like this is going to be a huge question. But I'm going to ask you in a nutshell, Chris. Give yeah. us a, give us a sense of the kind of conflicts between like landowners, land managers, and, and beavers. What are your, yeah, what are your quick takeaways from that, really? Okay. F first off, just think about what they do. They they eat trees or or, or fell trees. Uh, they create local flooding. They can also uh, raid crops as well. They have a very sweet tooth. So if you happen to be growing sugar beet or maize uh, alongside a stream, then look out. But if we have a, 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 a buffer for them to be able to rattle around in, that will help to reduce that, uh, uh, that hit. But also, they are very averse to electric fencing. So if you need to protect a crop, it's not hard to do. The local flooding, this is what you're getting paid for your, for your 20 meter buffer for. Uh, it, so it, a local flooding um, w will be your contribution to uh, the public good. Um, it, it's a different way of seeing things, but I believe that it is not uh, uh, impossible. I would just like to say to anyone on this, if you're down in Cornwall, come and have a look uh, at what we've done here. It is an enclosed site, sadly, and I'm looking forward very much to the day when we can just let the beavers go and get on with it. But come and have a look and you'll see. We still use the site. For, for grazing cattle uh, and uh, cutting firewood and ver various other, other uses besides the beavers doing there. We need to accept these animals as normal in our landscape and something that we live alongside. Um, but the, 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 uh, the, the, the conflicts, I believe, they're all resolvable, up to and including, of course, lethal control of the beavers if we need them. Where they are going to cause a problem, and this is so in Scotland, is we have floodplain agriculture with very high valued crops. Um, uh, and particularly where you've got uh, rivers which are perched um, behind uh, uh, flood banks, there is definitely, definitely a, a scope for, for nasty conflict there. They get over it in Bavaria um, uh, very, very simply, but it do that does require a little bit of investment. Chris, thank you. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you, all of our panellists, really. I think we will... Uh, start to wrap up now just because of time but um, what an interesting morning uh, really fascinating I hope you feel a little more informed I have loved seeing your questions coming through as well 
and we'll be uh, sharing a copy of this recording as well so if you want to go back and have a little bit more time to look through the slides um, and listen again then you absolutely can do that uh, as we mentioned earlier our slido poll is open for the rest of the day and there are three DEFRA consultation questions on there we would love it if as many of you as possible could just give your thoughts there we'll share all of those with DEFRA and just a final reminder that's nbs2 on slido.com so before I finish I just have a request um, we really genuinely hope you enjoyed this morning and we hope you found it interesting and educational and we really hope you like the fact that it was a free event and um, as a charity we really want to bring this kind of event to as wide an audience as possible and I think I personally believe I think we all do that it's critically important to building a really positive and resilient green recovery from our present circumstances like many charities in this sector we've been hard hit by the impacts of coronavirus and many of the activities that we use to support free webinars like this which are for the public benefit have just stopped so without support we're going to struggle to run these kind of events in the future if you did enjoy this morning and you'd like us to be able to continue our work then we'd be really grateful if you consider making a small donation and you can do that by heading to siwem.org forward slash donate and if you can do that we'd be grateful thank you it makes a huge difference and finally we really want to hear your feedback so if you've got a couple of minutes you'll automatically get a survey at the end of the webinar and uh, it'll also have a link to, as Rachel mentioned, a piece of work that they're doing around farmers and landowners and how they can participate in this enablers and barriers to NFM research project. So, of course, this was the second of three webinars in our series. We'd really like to see as many of you as, as we can have, have, us, have come back for next week's final session, which is at the same time. Uh, and next week we'll be hearing about how Elms can deliver nature recovery on a significant scale so that we can really start to think about achieving the 25 year environment plan ambition of being the first generation to leave the environment in a better state than we inherited. It promises to be another fascinating morning and I look forward to seeing you then. Have a great afternoon. Bye bye now.